Hi, everyone. This is Simma Lieberman, The Inclusionist, with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together across race to have comfortable conversations on race. If you have ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing and feeling attacked, or being ignored or trivialized, then this podcast is for you. If you like what you hear today, please go to www.raceconvo, convo like conversation, www.raceconvo.com and download more episodes. Please share episodes with other people. And if you really like what you, ha- what you hear today, we would love it if you would leave us a review and five stars. And if you'd like to donate to the show to help us keep going, then go to the site, raceconvo.com. Hit the donate button, donate, and you can make a tax deductible donation. I am so excited about my guest today. It is, he is Dr. Lonnie Avi Brooks. He is a professor of communication in Afro, Afrofuturism. I, I mean, actually, he's another guest of mine that has so many degrees that if I said all of his degrees and all of his accomplishments, that would be the whole show. So you'll have to hear more about what he has to say. And I got interested, well, first, the reason I got interested in him originally was he is a member of my synagogue and he is Jewish, black and native American. And I was interested in that, you know, in view of everything that was going on with all the people talking about black people, anti-Semitism, Jewish people, racism, all of that. And I thought it was really important to have him on the show. And then the more I've talked to him and found out about Afro Afrofuturism, then I said, okay, we have a couple of things to talk about here. So Avi, how are you today? What's happening? And uh, tell us a little about yourself and your background, because it's really interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great today. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, for sure. Really appreciate it. Um, and good to get a chance to get to know you. Um, well, you know, I, I, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, my father uh, was from Kansas City, Missouri, um, Black and, and Native American on his side. And then uh, my mom is a uh, Jewish, um, Ukrainian, Lithuanian on her side. Um, and, you know, so I know that my my great grandfather, <clears throat> Shmuel, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, he was about to be drafted into the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. And, you know, when that was happening, he was like, nope, that's not for me. I'm going straight to Brooklyn. So he had that vision visionary zeal to just go and be more prosperous and thrive in the u.s um and that's our legacy you know with the with the russian immigrate jewish immigrants who went to the u.s at that time um and my dad you know always proud of his legacy too he's no longer with us he passed away in 1979 but he you know he didn't have a traditional college education, but became a writer anyway, and an artist, and he created a foundation for struggling Black um, artists in the 70s. He produced a a play about the Black experience in Vietnam. Um, His name was Lonnie Brooks as well. And, um, you know, he just did these things that I'm like, wow, you know, he interviewed Amos and Andy for the LA Times. He... um, he was on the scene at the Patty Hearst shootout in LA. <laughs> I, I see pictures of him like at a party with Rosie Greer. He was on a daytime talk show. I'm just like, you know, so when I look back at what he did and, and what I'm doing now, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. He was an organizer. He was an investigative reporter. He was a writer. He was an artist. He he just really expressed himself in all these ways, despite not having, uh, you know, a full college education. It, you know, he he expressed his own genius. So, well, could you tell us what what was it like for you growing up? You grew up in in Los Angeles, right? As yeah, I, I, a person of of with a multicultural background like that. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, first. I grew up in Baldwin Hills and uh, predominantly black uh, neighborhood in LA. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was getting rougher back then, you know, um, it, you 
know, it's not as gentrified as it is now in terms of just uh, being more upscale for black people nowadays. Um, back then, you know, there 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 were gangs, uh, except like in Windsor Hills. I went to school in Windsor Hills, uh, and you know that was where like the black athletes lived, and, and maybe still do. Um, but I remember that experience and kind of being questioned about my culture, like who I was, are you black? Or are you white? You know, who are you? <laughs> and at, at, at some point I just said, well, I'm just human, you know? Um, and then we moved to the Fairfax district uh, as well. And so I grew up there, a traditionally Jewish neighborhood. And I went to Fairfax high school, but I grew up going to the Jewish community center and um that's where I kind of saw a more mosaic blend of Judaism around me and also those who weren't even Jewish that were going to the Jewish community center anyway. And, you know, I got, I got, I, it got into me that, you know, Jewish people are from everywhere. <laughs> and, um, and I was fortunate to have a, um, a college, a, a counselor at the time who um, developed a theater group with us and we 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 performed um Shakespearean and musicals um at the Jewish Community Center. And um so his name was Ray Esquith. Um he he mentored us in, in some very effective ways and uh owned that one. Um and that was you know a coming of age in terms of my Judaism too because we we practiced Shabbat um you know, I got to love you. I, I I got to love being Jewish through Hala, you know, through the. Well, oh, okay. Now, could you break down because a lot of my listeners are not Jewish. So, what's Shabbat and what's Hala? Yeah, well, Hala is the is the traditional Jewish bread, like made of eggs, um, you know, and it's really tasty and sweet. Um, although that sweetness doesn't last nearly long enough <laughs> if you leave it alone for a couple of days. Um, and Shabbat is the traditional Sabbath, Jewish Sabbath that starts on Friday sun, sundown to, to Saturday sundown. And um, that is, you know, a celebration of, of a day of rest, right? Um, and <clears throat> taking a break from everyday affairs. Um, yeah, and, we, you know, it was the 70s. So we did, we celebrated Shabbat at the Jew Jewish Community Center by, like, um doing skits to the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was it was a, a experimental on time with uh, with Jewish rituals um at that moment. And um you know so it was it's always been a kind of a, a lifelong journey to to integrate the different identities that I hold in terms of being black and Jewish and Native American and sort of you know really I mean I felt like it wasn't until recently that I was able to just kind of articulate them all more effectively and finally had my own I didn't have a bar mitzvah at 13 like most uh you know traditionally as most Jewish kids do um I had one in 2019 and uh it was through Jewish gateways that's based here in um the Bay Area and a wonderful rabbi um and really I got to have my bar mitzvah after my daughter had her bat mitzvah, bar bat mitzvah, um, the year before. So it's just like really nice to have that moment um, and express who I was. So I think, you know, growing up, it was just like um, traditional Jewish congregations um, at that time really didn't have significant numbers of Jewish Jews of color. So um, the Jewish Community Center was really the only space at that moment where I felt welcomed and accepted the most in terms of my Jewishness and being Black and Jewish and Native American all at once. Um, so I, I wasn't part of a traditional temple, and I was actually scared to go into one. Um, but funny story, though, funny story is that my my brother and I, we, we, we decided to go on Yom Kippur to one Orthodox temple. We didn't we didn't realize what orthodoxy meant. We ended up sitting accidentally in the women's section, and we were so mortified. But wait, for those who don't know, if you're Orthodox and you're Jewish and you're Orthodox, 
in synagogue, men sit on one side and women sit on the other side. So go ahead. Yeah, that we, you know, we sat in the women's section and people were staring at us. We were like, oh crap, we really, <laughs> we made a mistake. <laughs> so, so like embarrassed and we just ran out, you know, and it's just, it, we were trying to, you know, steer our own Jewishness through an orthodoxy that we just didn't understand, you know. Well, I know a lot of people in this country don't really know. I mean, there are people who, you know, I was listening. I don't know if you, you know who Charlemagne the God is? Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, one of his, his shows, he was talking about the fact that Jewish people are what, like, what, like two or three percent of the country and that most people have never even met a Jewish person. So that they don't even really know what a Jewish person is. And I know a lot of people think that all Jewish people are white. They don't understand about that. We're everything, you know, we're, we're, and we're from all over the world and we're still Jewish. And even, I think that there's, I know Jewish people who still don't even know that there are black Jews or, or Jews in, in China or India who have always been Jewish. So what was your experience like as a black person who was also Jewish and Native American in synagogues as you've gotten older and also with the people other, when you run into other Jewish people? What, what was, have you had any interesting experiences? Well, you know, um, I think, I think I went to UCLA, you know, and that's where I started to express more of my blackness and more of my Jewishness. So I actually went to Hillel at UCLA a bit um, and I was interviewed about this very subject too at the time because Farrakh Khan was, um, you know, the black Muslim and, and, and also pretty anti-Semitic at, the, at, the, at that moment. And so it was a, another inflection point where it's like, hmm, you know, where do I stand in my relationship to being Jewish and in, to my relationship to um, Israel and all that stuff. Um, but I found myself constantly going into the library and looking up uh, what Jewishness meant in terms of the different sects around it, you know, the, the different streams of Judaism, that is. And when I, um, so when I started, when my daughter was born in 2006, I wanted her, her my grand, my Jewish grandparents had passed away, and I wanted to bequeath this civilization and culture to her. They call it pediatric Judaism. <laughs> I re, I've, I've heard that called. And so uh, I started taking her to different synagogues around Oakland and um, and just realized where we might fit, you know. And, uh, you know, in, in the many con congregations, I just didn't see ourselves reflected. It was only until I came to Kahila Synagogue that I saw more Jews of color. You know, um, and and people will, you know, in other, you know, in synagogues will, will ask you, oh, you know, who are you? Like, you know, kind of it's a, a, a litmus test of are you Jewish and why are you here? It's sort of the implication unless they outright say, are you Jewish? You know, and I've experienced that a, you know, maybe a, once or twice a keel and not not as often as in other places, but it does happen. So, you know, um, it, it, you know, I mean, just remember one experience where my daughter, who had been going to um, Kihila's uh, after school program, Hebrew school, um, you know, for years, uh, was asked by a staff person, kind of unwittingly, but like, oh, who are you? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, or like what? You know, and it just it maybe it just wasn't said in the right way because it was it was kind of like disregarding her whole time in being Jewish from from kindergarten, you know. So um, anyway, her mom's Filipina, um, Jocelyn, and so my daughter has is half Filipina and half me, and we decided to raise her Jewish, and in the tradition. So you know. Um, seeing her kind of uh, thrive in this environment and actually be able to express herself in her Jewish um, Jewishness at her uh, bat mitzvah was really touching. Um, 
but again, you know, we're at in this stage where we're actually uh, re envisioning what Hebrew school can be like at Kihila too, that can be more inclusive of Jews of color. So my experience has been um, pretty positive overall, but that, you know, Kihila as a synagogue and many synagogues across the country have undergone a soul searching uh, introspection of this arc of change with Yavila McCoy uh, in, in dimensions where we've been trying to dismantle shreds of white supremacy and that are ha that you know happen in synagogues um, and when we're trying to make more spaces and places um, make people affirmed in as Jews of color because some of the you know some of the questions that come up again are like oh what are you doing here are you Jewish you know like, I mean how does, that, how does that impact I mean that must impact you when somebody says that to you when you, like hey man like I'm Jewish all my life this is my home too yeah yeah right and you know sort of we actually have a kind of um a new statement a make space take <laughs> make space take space statement where we're asking folks not to ask that question to welcome everybody and to not assume whether or not they're jewish and just assume that they have a right to be there and to speak you know and articulate who they are in the manner that they want to you know, um, and I think that's so important because um, I, I, you know, I just, I, I, I grew up not feeling as embedded in the Jewish uh, tradition as I could have, you know, yeah. and I've, I've had to articulate it and carve it out myself and make it happen, you know, and make, and, you know, because Jesus was Jewish, you know, Jesus was Jewish and he was like a brown person you know he wasn't he wasn't european he wasn't white he was not white so um you know understanding that he was a middle eastern a middle easterner you know adjacent to africa you know so um you know they they have recreated what he looked like through forensic anthropology and he looks you know a brown ancient Israeli guy, <laughs> Lebanese, you know, um, so um, well, that, yeah, that's really important. Yeah, you know, I want to, I want to ask you, because I was getting a lot of calls about this too, that, you know, during what, when things are happening, like with Kanye West was saying he liked Hitler, blah, blah, blah. And so on social media, there was so much, and people were asking me too, they said, well, why are black people anti-Semitic or why are Jews so racist? And one thing I think that a lot of that is BS, you know, when you're like saying, why are all these people and these people without acknowledging the fact that a lot of Jewish people are not white. And the fact is that a lot of, there's a lot of, of mixture, black, African-American and Jewish. And the fact is that a lot of African-American people, a lot of Jewish people have Deep relationships have been working together for years. So why did that, you know, how did, how did I mean, it, it made me, it made me angry to have people say, so, I mean, I saw what I thought was just a whole bunch of ignorance, but um, what, what about you? Like, how did that affect you? And what were you thinking? What were you saying? Yeah. You know, I, I was just thinking how annoying it is to have, um, you know, people of all ethnicities um, in these positions of power and authority and wealth that are just speaking nonsense, from Elon Musk to to Kanye West um, to Donald Trump, and just saying, just kind of really taking our culture backwards. You know, like like it. You know, um, in Kanye's in Kanye's uh, context, I mean, I understand he has some mental illness, you know, too, and struggles with that. But like to kind of be given this platform um, to rage against um, Jewish people in that manner, it's just kind of, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't help anyone. It's part of a, I think, I think it's actually part of a systemic white supremacy, to tell you the truth, because it's given people like, it gives people license to, um, to express 
this uh, hatred towards other groups. And I think we're all victims of it. You know, black, white, in between, we're all victims of white supremacy and we're, we need to dismantle it. Well, what do you mean by that? We're all victims of white supremacy. Could you say more? I mean, a lot of people who listen to this show like, have no idea what, what the heck we're talking about. So, but we want to enlighten them. You know, we want people to understand. So yeah, how, you know, so tell me how you think, I know how I think it is. How, how do you think it is? I mean, it's a conversation for 500 years that has really, um, um, you know, privileged white people and, um, and, and disadvantaged other groups, you know, through sex, through slavery and erasure of cultures. And white supremacy, though, hinders um, white people themselves because at the end of the day, a successful society is going to um, acknowledge everyone as having an equal right to life and prosperity and wealth and dignity. And so um, if you're if if you're holding a certain group back to maintain your privilege, you're just hurting yourself and you're narrowing your own um, opportunities to have a fulfilling life. And you're also um, creating systemic oppression that results in crime and homelessness and um, all the things that we don't like about our society. Um, you know, it just uh, it just keeps people down and in so doing if you're keeping someone else down you're keeping yourself down too you're keeping yourself from really understanding um what the earth is about you know um who you are so i think in order to know yourself you need to acknowledge um the rich cultures and dignities of others so you know i think in kanye saying what he does it's just it's 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 you know out of an ignorance that you know it only it only supports a white supremacist structure you know and a lot you know and a, a, and a lot of people co a lot i mean i saw a lot of people co-signing it and i think that you know from from what i saw i mean tell me what you think i think that you had a lot of very reactionary right-wing jewish people who jumped on the bandwagon and a lot of them are, you know, allied with, say, the extreme right in our country, jumping on the bandwagon to then say racist, make racist statements against black people like that. So Kanye West spoke for all black people, you know. Um, and then you had some black people and other people who were very, who were ignorant. They don't know any Jewish people. And, you know, and when you, I think like when, when you've been oppressed, I think that people are always looking for like answers and and blame and instead of looking at where the source of this was white supremacy people started like going after each other because i think that some of like the the people the people on the right who are jewish have a lot of platform they have you know not all jewish people don't have money but but these particular people were able to make themselves heard in a way that some people were able to think that that was coming from all Jewish people and that some of the things that some of the black people were saying, people thought, oh, it must be coming from all of them. And I think maybe that's a social media problem or it's definitely an ignorance problem, but I think it's also a problem of people not knowing each other and not talking to each other because, you know, how many people were like blaming like the super bazillionaires in the country who are tend to be like white Christian nationalists but you have people fighting each other and some people who I believe really ferment, fermented that because when you have black people and Jewish people who know each other, or you have somebody who's black and Jewish or whatever, or like people like my family, which is interracial, you don't have that. I mean, we have intercultural inter, you know, into everything events at, at what we did at my house. So I mean, just, what are what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, I think what you said, what you mentioned, I mean, it, um, you know, instead of paying attention to the to the to the one percenters who who are kind of uh, keeping us all down, <laughs> um, they kind of it's like this manufactured cultural war or or ethnic inner ethnic war that you know really doesn't have to be. Um, you know, uh, there's certainly 
you know, I just, I just feel like more understanding of, of who black people are and who Jewish people are and that there's, um, I love this image by one of my favorite artists, um, Nane Brown. He's an Afrofuturist artist and he has this great image called What's Your Black? And it has these kind of futuristic black beings looking at different screens. And what they're looking at is the different flavors of the black diaspora that emerged. You know, black people, black persons experience in Latin America is going to be different from the from a black person's experience in the United States, from Canada, you know, to Mexico, you know, um, what it means to be Brazilian and black is going to be so different. So, you know, we are, you know, so many different shades of black, you know, and that's the richness of the black diaspora in in Africana traditions. And you have people who are Brazilian and Jewish. I mean, so we're, all of us are all, all, all over the place. And then you have people in Africa who are Jewish, um, and some of the Igbos in Nigeria who were one of the lost tribes of of Israel. Yeah, right. It was the the Ethiopian Jews. Yeah, the Ethiopian Jews too. Yeah. So we are all Mm -hmm. over it. And not just, it's not just one type of black person, one type of Jewish person, one type of Jewish black person. And I think that it's so important for people to know that now. And if we're looking at the future, and that's why I want, I'm interested now in, can you tell us about Afro, Afrofuturism? Yeah, I mean, Afrofuturism combines science fiction and fantasy to envision alternative futures based on the Black experience. And um, I really love this metaphor. I think it's from Toni Morrison, actually, where, you know, if you kind of think of the um, the idea of, of how slavery began, it's this, it's like a science fiction horror story where millions of Africans are kidnapped um, from their home planet in West Africa. And with the latest in modern technologies at the time are taken across these ships that are fast, that cross this vast Atlantic interstellar sea. And when they arrive in the Americas, they faced a total erasure of their culture. They could be killed if they spoke their language, practiced their music, played, um, you know, played their music, practiced their religion. And Christianity was imposed upon uh, African slaves. And what did they do? They took Christian hymnals and transformed them into spirituals, you know, in the U.S. tradition. And spirituals speak about Zion. They speak about places that are free of slavery. And then spirituals become the foundation for blues, for jazz, for hip hop, for rock and roll, for trap music, for electronic music. And it's what um, a, a great colleague of mine, Amos, um, and I call our spirit, our cultural vibranium. You know, scholars call spirituals and uh, things that came after it, like sonic utopias. And so um, this is part of Afrofuturism. Our cultural vibranium, like the vibranium that powered the city of Wakanda and the Black Panther films, this is our superpower to, because we have to become hybrid futurists in the face of the erasure of our culture. We had to refashion and remake and um, really take from our own memories of our ancestral intelligence and fold them into the American experience, that alien experience. Um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, he wasn't just a sociologer, sociologist. He was one of the first um, Black uh, men, Black people to get a PhD at Harvard in sociology. And he was also a science fiction writer. So he created this fictional instrument called the Megascope to look for the undiscovered stories of our peoples. And I love that because that really points to this whole metaphor. Another potent symbol of Afrofuturism is the mothership. It's the mother load of our ancestral intelligence, what I call the real AI, that we have used to be resilient in the face of erasure, but also we have made many discoveries uh, culturally and scientifically and you know mathematically 
And so we're really in this process of recovering our memories, the lost erasures of our cultures through colonialism. And I think that's really what powers Afrofuturism. It's leveraging the past to amplify it into the future and to create future visions based on that. Well, I think especially now it's so important. I mean, I really, you know, when I went to the, see, see the exhibit at the, at the Oakland Museum, I love the exhibit. But now when I think about how Afrofuturism, in my opinion, I don't know, you know, but tell me what, what you just, just like from, as from a white Jewish person looking at it, it seems to me that it really is about not only preserving the culture, but looking at where the culture could, has potential to go. And I think about that because I think about what's happening in in this country with it trying to really erase the history of of black people in the United States, and really, in, in my opinion, trying to erase black people essentially saying, "Oh, you know, just they're just fit into being an American, which is like completely going to destroy." You know, they they really just want to do, destroy a whole culture of people. And so, when you look at Afrofuturism, I mean, and I mean, tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. It seems like this is really even. This is really, um, it's being revolutionary because it's really fighting against the erasure of of the history of African-American people in this country. Because you're saying it, this is what happened, this is happening now, and this is where we're going. And if you look at where we're going, you can't forget about what happened. Did, uh, did, did I make sense? Was that, did, I, did I make sense? Yeah. yeah, I think you do. You do, you know, I mean, there's a, a movement called the Black Speculative Arts Movement, co-founded by Ronaldo Anderson. It comes out of an exhibition called Unveiling Visions, the Alchemy of the Black Imagination that was put on at Schoenberg um, Center for Black Research in New York City. And out of this came this movement, uh, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, to become a celebration. It's like a festival conference of the celebration of the Black imagination that happens annually in different countries around the world, it's a global movement. Wow. In fact, the fastest chapter of it is in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And um, I'll be going to um, Medellin next week in Colombia to celebrate Afro-Colombiano's version of Afrofuturism. And I think this movement is helping to kind of stave off that erasure and um, looking for solutions to gentrification, um, you know, in what way can we have reparations um, in other ways, trying to take claim even into new technology like virtual reality as well and proclaim our space and create a safe space in these new technological horizons, including even artificial intelligence. So, you know, we're, so I think, I think there's room for hope, even as we struggle with, you know, the daily existence of what it means to be black in America. And it seems to me too that I, you know when you're talking, I, something that came to mind is that by doing what Afrofuturists are doing, it's really using guerrilla tactics to not only to preserve a culture, but like. I mean, to like expand, to me, I mean, like expand, expand the culture, say, hey, you know what? We're not going nowhere. You know, we've been here. Here's what's happening. And here's all the, po the all the potential that there is. And when you have that and people see it, especially like people who are, who are black and they see it, then they know that, that they exist, that they existed before, they exist now. They have power, they're going somewhere. And it seems to me that for non-black people also that, they then have to appreciate the culture and the history of African Americans in this country and decide do they want to be part of the future or not. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, growing up in the 70s, I hardly saw, and the 70s was a great period for science fiction. And oh, America. yeah, I got into it heavy in the 70s. <laughs> right. But I didn't see many, I, I hardly saw anyone black that reflected me in those futures, except for maybe Lieutenant Uhura, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and Lieutenant Forge and, and uh, you know, the next generation of Star Trek. But the idea of what the Black Speculative move, Arts Movement does is use aesthetics, right, as that, as that guerrilla tactic to, you know, create a million different versions of Afrofuturism to saturate our ecosystem so that 
our young folks can grow up with visions of the future. And this isn't only just Afrofuturism. There's a, a movement of indigenous futurism that looks at Native American visions of the future, even queer futurism too. So, um, you know, I think it's really important and Arab futurism as well, you know. And so it's like this idea of um, these multicolored hues of what the future can look like. Um, and, and really, I love that, how you said that, you know, it's about aesthetics. It's about creating ecosystems where our youth, our young people can see agency and be the signal themselves. Um, as you know, so the, as part of the, uh, I co-founded the Afro Rhythms Future Group with Ahmed Best, who's, um, he actually played Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars. Oh, wow. And, that's pretty cool. And he's now been reincarnated as a new Jedi in The Mandalorian. <gasps> and he... I love The Mandalorian. <laughs> oh, I yeah. love that show. So cool. Love it, love yeah. it, love it. He is in episode four of season three of The Mandalorian. And uh, he's badass. He uses his own martial arts techniques to save the baby Yoda. You know? The baby Yoda. <laughs> The cutest thing that ever existed in the whole world. <laughs> I, I I got stuck on YouTube looking at like there was like these little things that people go, the seven adorablenesses of baby Yoda. And I should have been working, but instead I'm looking at baby Yoda. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a triumph to see him in that role. And he often talks about, and we're working actually on a book on this um, called Be the Signal. And how can we, you know, actually show how Black people, Indigenous people have often been the signals of change in our society, aesthetically, technologically, you know, culturally. Um, you know, we've been, he has this great story about Grandmaster Flash because he grew up in the Bronx. Yeah, I grew up in and, the Bronx. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. I mean, he has this great story of how Grandmaster Flash as an electrician came down, you know, created this machine called the Crossfader, plugged it wow. into a, a lamp. And the Crossfader was, you know, how to keep this music going all night long, you know. Matt, Grandmaster Flash, man, and he was like a pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. He was a signal. He was the yeah. signal. Yeah. He doesn't get right. to create the Crossfader, but he was the signal. <laughs> and, and what you just said you know it made me think too more like thinking about like the past present future especially for, like for young people because i think that a lot of young people based on what's ha happening now in this country you know like the, the the almost annihilation of native american culture and the refusal to recognize the history of native americans and what's happened to native americans in this country and then you know the, they're trying to attempt to annihilate the history and culture of african americans and and everybody else who's not like, you know, a white, a white Christian, that it's easy for people to get discouraged. It's easy for people to get really depressed and feel like it's futile and that we're not going anywhere. And for me, if you don't know who you are, where you've been, where your history is, then it's easy to give up. But if with Afrofuturism and these other futurisms, I mean, I mean, again, this is just like for me as an outsider looking in, that not only does it give people self-esteem to move forward, but it gives people the impetus to be, want to be more creative and to come out with like new systems, new tactics, new new science, new technology, and to really be on the forefront and know that you're not making a difference just for everybody, but also for yourself and and your own group. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking too too out there, but you know, I can go there too. So, oh, I mean, um, you know, I, I I'm proud that. Um, with a grant from the Robert Woods Johnson's Foundation and also Blue Shield Foundation, we created um, a, a program at the Museum of Children's Arts in Oakland called the Community Future School. Where wow. We have parts of high school students learning about Afrofuturism and indigenous futurism and queer futurism and learning how to be strategic agents of change across, and we have a you know, mix of Black, Latino, Latinx um, and, and uh, Arab youth um, that are learning this and uh, developing their own set of guerrilla tactics aesthetically and creating vibrant art about 
in, in creating their manifesto for what Oakland might look like in 2045. Wow. And that's, that's the, that's the Oakland, Oakland Children's uh, it's, Museum. It's, um, it's the uh, Museum of Children's Arts uh, called MOCA. Oh, MOCA. In okay. Downtown Oakland. And uh, the executive director is uh, Nina Woodruff Walker. Um, Woodruff Walker. She took, a, she took a class of mine in Afrofuturism and she was like, I'm bringing Afrofuturism to MOCA, you know? <laughs> See, but so look at the impact that you had, your class had, and hopefully, like being on the show, you'll have an impact on more people too. Now, I'm looking at the time. Now, I could talk to you forever because I really am it's something I'm really interested in. I know you have, I know you have things to do. So I'm, I ask this question, it's three questions I ask people or four questions I ask people. First question number one is, what is on your playlist right now? What are you listening to music-wise? People always want to know, what are the people listening to? You know, I'm listening to some African uh, African artists like Ofeje, um, an African giant. Um, those are some, I'm listening to more African music these days, but also Meklit, Meklit, love Meklit. She is awesome. She, um, Ethiopian, I think of origin and she's a big Bay Area artist. And um, oh. the way that she talks about the past and present and future, um, she actually like, consulted with NASA too. Oh man, part of her that's big. <laughs> And uh, and recently she was hitting the I, um, the Buena um, Buena Buena Arts Program in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Um, I was just anyway. there for a conference. Yeah. Wow. So uh, McLeet is amazing. So those are some of the folks I'm listening to. Uh, you know, and you know I've gotten interested in in um, oh there's this really great oh what's her name a great uh, Ethiopian is. Really, a woman singer who I love. Uh, I'm gonna look her up just because I just I just need. She's to still remember. alive. She's still alive. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. She's 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 kind of up and wow. coming. If you open is really, that would be cool. Yeah, she is really really cool, and I'm I'm just gonna um, look her up real quick because uh, easy name. Um, her oh yeah, Esther Rada, Rada, Esther Rada. E S T E R, and that's her first name and last name is R A D A. R A D A. Okay. Yeah, she's amazing. Okay, and then next question is: any films, TV shows, movies that you're watching that you would recommend? Besides The Mandalorian, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, um, gosh, um, so many. I like. I love The Watchmen. That was on oh HBO. yeah, the watching was good, especially yeah. in the beginning when they showed Tulsa. Yeah. Man, that was so real. It was so so creative and amazing. Um, I'm also watching the um, at a TV adaptation of Kindred from Octavia Butler. It's I on... said, man, that book. Okay, well, that's my book. I don't recommend Kindred right now by Octavia Butler. Okay, <laughs> so there's a there's. A movie, this TV show. Okay, I got to check that out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I like the way it's done. It takes some uh, differences, slight differences with the book, but I, you know, and it's it's a thriller to me. It's like a, like oh no, you know, I can I, I have to watch it in spurts. But I, I really enjoying it. You know, I, you know, it's hard to give full justice to Octavia Butler's novels. I think. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I'm I'm glad for the effort to try to do that. Um, she oh, was a futurist. Oh. oh my God, she was a futurist. She, I just saw Parable of the Sower as an opera at Cal Berkeley. What? Last Friday night with uh, Toshi Reagan, this folklore singer. Really? Right? Oh man, yeah. I love Toshi Reagan. I mean, you know, she's been around oh, for a long time. My God, it was just stunning to see this take place. Wow. And, you know, I thought I, I just it was just great to just see it staged, to see it staged as an opera and, and to like it was like an experiment, you know, to see it come to life. That I, would I just be thought, amazing. OK, next yeah. question. Um, any books that you recommend? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I have to. <laughs> well, I have to recommend. Um, 
Uh, Santok, um, how indigenous wisdom uh, can save the world by um, uh, Tyson Youngaporta. Um, okay. Also, Afrofuturism 2.0, the rise of astro blackness. Wow. Uh, Afrofuturism 2.0. Okay. Yeah, 2.0. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, Grace Dillon's Walking on the Clouds, which is about a whole compilation of Native American science fiction stories. Wow. And you know what? I recommend, I just got, to, well, I just got done rereading Kindred and it had a different meaning for me now, you know, reading it because I read it when I was really young, you know, mainly I read it for the story, but now, you know, it had a deeper meaning culturally. But also the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois was an amazing book. I, I can't remember her name, but it was such a good, good, good book about, you know, those history, I mean, way history wow. and how people are impacted today. So it, it, I couldn't put, it was another book I couldn't put down. So one final question for you. Well, two final questions. One final. So what do you think we need to do? Like, you know, this is a cross, um, cross, cross race conversation about race. Anything, what do you think people need to do? If people want to have these kind of conversations, what's something that you think people could do? Uh, like, I want to end white supremacy. What do I do? I want to have a conversation about race. What do you, so what do you recommend? Yeah, you know, I recommend, um, you know, if, if, if you see like a, um, a Comic-Con around, uh, you know, Afrofuturism or Afro Comic Con in general, there there happen. There's one in at the library at SF every year uh, to attend them. You know to wow. attend these types of of conferences because you know your kids are going to enjoy it. Seeing different you know different types of uh, genres of comics, um, and I think it really helps to kind of affirm because in comic books it's like also affirming different alternative visions of the future, you know? Wow. And um, if there's a black speculative arts movement festival, you know, think about going to it too, you know? Where, where is uh, it? Well, you know, they happen across the country. They happen okay. in different countries. So, um, you know, we're overdue and organizing one in, in Oakland uh, because, you know, we, we did them in 17 and 18, 2017 through 2019 and one in 2020, but like we um, in San Diego is very active right now too. So they have their own, um, uh, we call them BSAM, Black Speculative Arts Movement chapter in San Diego. There's gonna be, um, there's gonna be a, like a, a big Afro uh, Comic-Con going on there too. Um, I think in the summer and along with the, the Comic-Con show that goes on there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I say seek these out and maybe I can send you, uh, yeah. can you put like resources I can, I can send I, to you? I was just going to ask, I was going to ask, uh, what's your website? If people want to, you know, find more out more about you and you're going to send me all of your links so that I could, when, when we do the, when we do the show notes, we're going to have all the links, everything about you Afrofuturism, everything that you want people to know about Dr. Lonnie Avi Brooks is going to be on the site. So if you don't get it right now, just you'll check out the site. But what is your what? But do you have a main website for anybody who's just yeah, listening we, now? We just launched, we're just launching our new website, and it's called AfroRhythms.com. You take Afro, and then you take okay. rhythms from Afro Rhythms. So it's Afro, and then R I T H M S Afro Rhythms. Dot com. That's our website. Afrorhythms, R-I-T-H-M-S dot com. Yeah. Afrorhythms dot com. Hey, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. I've been wanting to get you on for so long. And we go to the same synagogue, so that's really cool. Uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to you some more. And I'm just going to close. So could you just stay for one second, about a minute more? Okay. Sure thing. So, hey, everybody, you've just listening to me and Simit the Inclusionist in conversation with Dr. Lani Abi Brooks. And uh, if you like the show, if you, if you like the show that you heard today, please download it. Please share it with other people. Please leave us a review because we need reviews because it'll help us get more visibility. And if you really like what you hear to say, hear, heard today, 
please share it with at least one or two other people. So this is Sima Lieberman, The Inclusionist, signing off until next time.